Howdy, howdy, my dudes. Welcome back to Gong Fu Tea Cha. We have not made one of these in a long time, but we are extremely excited to be back in the studio filming about tea for y'all. And today we are going to be talking about white tea, but not just white tea. We're going to be talking about fresh white tea because there's a difference, a very important difference between fresh and aged white tea. And so we're going to start at the beginning with the white tea in its fresh state. And I'm gonna go ahead and just dive into a little discussion of what white tea is for the Western audience. So, back in the 1990s, a beverage company called Snapple released an advertisement that, uh, for a product that involved white tea, and they needed to explain to the American public who had never heard of white tea before, what is white tea? And they had to do that in like a 30 second commercial or whatever. And so rather than go through a whole discussion about tea being one plant and everything that you would truly need to explain what white tea is, they said, what's white tea? It's just the buds. And I do this because the bud is the first growth of the tea plant that comes out. And it's considered the most valuable and juiciest part of the tea plant, the most highly sought after part of the tea plant. So their explanation for white tea is that it's just the buds, the tippy little parts that come off. When you hear about English teas, for example, being called tippy, tippy golden orange pico, etc. They're talking about these buds that come out. And the reason that t what tippy means is that it contains a lot of these first growth buds and is therefore more valuable. So Snapple's explanation was that white tea is just the buds. This is not actually the case. There are teas from all categories from all over China that are made with just the buds because again, it's considered the most valuable part of the tea. So if you're making some tea and you wanna make a premium tea, then you can do so by sequestering this early growth, these early growth buds and making a whole batch of tea from just these buds. It's very expensive because the yield of buds is very small compared to the yield of leaves. And the way it looks like is this. You got a tea plant, the top of the tea plant, and you got a bud coming out, just like a little bud, slender little bud coming out, and then that one opens and then you get little leaves coming out and another bud comes out. And so the plucking standards in China uh, from highest grade to lower grades is like just the buds is called danya, single bud. And then the buds and one leaf, bloop, picking them both at the same time, is called iya ye, one bud, one leaf. And then you get bloop, iya liang ye, uh, one bud, two leaves. And, um, and then you've got other lower plucking standards from that depending on the season and the type of tea, etc. But in the most formal um, designations of plucking standards in China, you get dan ya, yi ya, yi ya, and yi ya, liang ya. And so when you make um, tea out of just these buds, you get a very high quality product. Why are the buds so valuable? One, they have the most tea chemicals in them. They have the most tea juju in them like caffeine, for example, and uh, um, antioxidants, EGCG, things like that. And of course, people didn't know that, but what people do know, uh, they know that now. They didn't know that back in the day when they were first making these all bud, all bud teas. But they could tell that these buds had a lot of chi, and that's kind of the perception of that chi relates to this higher content of tea chemicals in it. Also, the buds have these little downy hairs on them, and those hairs are what produces the fragrant aromatic oils of the tea. And so the buds are very fragrant. They don't have as much taste in the mouth but they have a lot of fragrance. And so for those reasons, they're highly sought after. And you can make green tea with all buds. You can make red tea with all buds, like Jinju and Mei is all buds. You can even make puar out of all buds. For example, Ya Bao, which is kind of a puar, sort of unorthodox, but it's from some puar-like plants and it's all buds. And so if it's not all buds, if white tea's not just all buds, then what is it? White tea is raw. That's a really, really easy answer for that. White tea is, by definition, tea that is picked and then allowed to dry without being cooked, without being sha chinged. We talked about in other episodes the sha ching process where you cook the tea in a wok and swirl it around and denature the enzyme polyphenol oxidase. That the purpose of that step is to halt the oxidation process of tea. And so white tea does not undergo this sha ching fixing process. And so it continues to oxidize, albeit slowly because it's dry, over time. And so white tea being raw, you could say that white tea is the most naturalistic form of tea. If a tea plant were to, a branch were to break off a tea plant and just dry somewhere, and you were to drink the leaves from that, tree, that uh, branch, you'd be drinking white tea. In fact, my friend Steve O'Dell accidentally made white tea in his pocket one time because we were up in the mountains picking tea and he put some leaves in his pocket and he forgot about it. And then a week and a half later we found them and they were dry and we drank them and it was white tea. He made it by accident in his pocket, it was good. 
Um, and so although I refer to green tea as the true taste of tea, the true natural taste of tea is captured in green tea, the most naturalistic taste of tea is in white tea. And what I mean by this is that if you were to go munch a leaf off of a fresh, <makes> munch a leaf off of a fresh tea plant, just like that, <makes> um, then it would be, taste like green tea. But if you were to, but you can't drink fresh tea leaves. It just doesn't really work. I've tried it. It's not very good. It's extremely astringent. Um, so you couldn't just dry out tea leaves and then get them to taste that way. You have to fix them. And so you're preserving that fresh tea taste in a form that's soluble and preserved so that you can keep it on a shelf and you can drink it a couple weeks later and you still get that fresh green tea taste. But white tea is the natural taste of tea left to its own devices having very little human intervention. And so white tea generally is made by picking it and then allowing it to dry usually in the sun or in the shade, ideally uncovered on a cloudy day. And so the art of making white tea is unlike oolong or even red tea or green tea where the skill is in the process. Skillful cooking, skillful roasting, skillful massaging, uh, skillful oxidizing, um, etc., withering. The white tea doesn't undergo a lot of intensive processing. It's just left to dry. And the skill of making white tea is reading the weather, knowing where to put your tea to dry, what the best tea spot to dry your tea is, or saying, it's too sunny today to make white tea. We're gonna make green tea instead. Or it's too, it's raining today. We can't make white tea because it's too humid. The tea would dry out too, so let's make red tea. And so that's the skill of a white tea. Tea master is in being able to tell what conditions, which we have no control of, are going to yield the best white tea. And there's a lot of skill involved in that. Indeed, even though there's not a lot of technical uh, aspects to it. And so why did Snapple tell the world that white tea was all buds? Because there is a very famous all bud white tea that is so well known to have become almost synonymous with white tea, um, especially in the West in the past couple decades and that's called Bai Hao Yinjun White Hair Silver Needle. And this is a Danya All Bud White Tea. Bloop, there you go, isn't that pretty? It's a pretty little white tea. And so this is All Buds, it's picked in the very, very early spring. And Bai Hao means white hair, and Yinjun means silver needle. And you can see that it has, the, the leaves have this, I'm gonna look at it. The leaves have this frosted kind of appearance to them, this downy frosted appearance to them, and that is, uh, tons of tiny little white hairs that are projecting off of the leaf itself, and those are called trichomes. And those little projections, those little filamentous projections, um, they are there to protect the young bud of the tea plant because they keep bugs from getting to it. It's almost like a little shield of little barbs that if you're bug-sized, it keeps you away from getting the leaf, it keeps you from getting too close to the leaf. And so they're there to protect the young little buds as they're developing so they can open to a nice strong tough leaf that won't be munched by bugs quite so easily. And they also happen to produce a lot of the tea chemicals that we associate with tea being good as we talked about earlier, the caffeine, the antioxidants, the EGCG. All of those other things are more abundant in the buds than they are in the leaves. And so white hair silver needle by Hao Yin Jun is a very highly prized, very expensive, if it's good, um, early spring tea and they pick it early in the spring when there's mostly buds, when there's not a lot of open leaves on the plant, the, what you'd call the first flush um, using the British designation system. And they pick these buds and there's some leaves in there, the whole fully open leaves, they pick them out so that you get a nice pure all bud batch of white tea and it's very beautiful looking. And this particular one, this type of tea comes from Fujian. All white tea originates in Fujian, in Fuding, just south of Zhejiang, so in the northern part of Fujian province, actually not very far from the Wuyi Mountains. Fujian, as I've mentioned, is kind of the origination point of many different types of tea, including red tea, AKA black tea, oolong tea, and white tea all originate there. And so they're very innovative with the things that they do to tea. And of course, because white tea is so naturalistic, I'm sure that white tea was being produced all over China, even before you know people were recording stuff about tea widely. But in the past thousand years or whatever, green tea has become the dominant type of tea produced all over China. Anywhere that they grow tea, they're making some kind of green tea because you have that control over the process. And so, the, and Lu Yu does talk about white tea being from northern Fujian. He does discuss that. And so the tradition of making white tea in northern Fujian apparently goes back all the way to the very beginnings of tea culture in China. And in Fujian, they have bred mostly, mainly two 
big breeds of tea uh, called Dabai and Dahao, big white and big hair. And those are breeds of tea that have been selected for the trait of having big, beautiful uh, buds that have lots of these little white hairs on them. And so they've amplified those traits through selective breeding generation after generation. And now you have these distinctive white tea breeds. That's not to say that you need to use those breeds to make white tea. You can make white tea out of pretty much any kind of tea at all. Any breed of tea, any uh, land race of teas can be used to make white tea. But th the tradition of white tea traces its roots back to Fuding in northern Fujian, where they use these breeds of tea that are selected for their big, beautiful downy buds. And they process them in this traditional way of uh, sun drying them and letting them have their natural taste. And the grades are silver needle is the highest grade because like I said, just the bud, Danya, only buds. That's like, it's like, it's like if, if a pluck of tea was a cupcake, then the buds would be the icing, you know, the frosting on top. And so you got just the frosting, like just that sweet deliciousness, the part that everybody likes, you get just that. It's like Lucky Charms with just marshmallows. I don't know, I'm, my analogies on this are very sugar heavy right now. But anyways, you get the silver needle, which is all buds. And then you have the, the second and third grades are uh, later in the spring, after the silver needle, you have uh, Baimudan white peony. It doesn't have peonies in it, a peony type of flower. It's just named after peonies. And what that is is a later spring harvest that includes some leaves and different grades of Baimudan exist. You get Mudan Wang, which is almost silver needle. It's just mostly buds and then a few leaves. And then you have lower grades of, of white peony where it's mostly leaves and some buds. And then the latest harvest after any reasonable amount of buds is already gone. It can be almost all leaves. It's called Shomei, which means longevity eyebrow. And that is a tea that is almost completely fully opened leaves and then a few slender white buds. And the reason it's called longevity eyebrow is because the, the dried white buds that look just like these little silver needle buds, except they're surrounded by a bunch of dark leaves, look like the white eyebrows of an elderly person whose hair has turned white and therefore they have lived a long life and the Chinese are really into longevity. And so they call that shomei, longevity eyebrow. And those are the three grades of white tea that you find in Fujian, the home of white tea. So I'm gonna go ahead and start making these. And I, I'm just, I wanna point out, you look at these three teas and you see that they, they look like there's different amounts of tea. The silver needle barely covers the bottom of the tin and then you get the, the inner sun kind of filling it up and then last we've got wild purple white that's kind of popping out there. Each of these has five grams of tea in it and it goes to show you how the buds are very dense and very heavy. And so in uh, another reason they're expensive is because in a, a kilogram of buds, all bud tea, you're gonna get many more plucks. And each one of those plucks represents a certain amount of human effort that had to go into the process of making that tea. And so uh, you get a lot more little buds and a little, uh, little plucking events in that tea. And so um, I'm gonna go ahead and start with the silver needle and I'm gonna go ahead and use my beautiful white slip painted dye gaiwan here. I just, I was gonna use mutton fat jade for this, but we just did that on the last episode and I figured white wares for white tea is just too much, you know? So it went a little earthier today, going with these dye wares. I'm excited, we just got these in. But uh, the silver needle is very light in flavor. And actually, fun story, I didn't used to think I liked white tea. And, and this is, I used to work at a tea house. Um, I mean, I still work at a tea house, but before I ever opened a tea house, before I ever went to China, I worked at a different tea house and my job was to be their, their tea, I led their tea program. I taught people how to pour tea and I served Gong Fu Cha to people and I kind of introduced that to their, their business. And people would ask me, what's your favorite kind of tea, Sohan? And I would say, I like all teas, except white tea. I don't really like white tea, it tastes like water. And that's how I thought, that's how I felt. And even through my, my uh, uh, time living in China, in Chengdu, in the far west of China, I still thought that I didn't like white tea. And the reason for that is because I'd only ever had silver needle and I had never had very good silver needle. I'd always had cheap silver needle. And it tasted to me like water. It looked and tasted like water. It had pretty much uh, no discernible flavor and not even really any discernible color. And so I was like, white tea, what's the point? Um, and also I had had uh, white peony 
by Mudan, but again, I'd had it fresh. And I actually much prefer, even to this day, I much prefer white peony and uh, by Mudan and Chaumet, the lower grades of white tea, I much prefer them aged. Uh, but I still like Silver Needle Fresh, and I learned to like Silver Needle, actually not by being introduced to Silver Needle first. I got into aged white tea first. Living in Sichuan, I was served aged white tea by someone from Fujian, uh, and this is uh, on a return trip to, to Chengdu. I met someone from Fujian, his name is Yushi Hong. Yushi Hong, if you're watching, appreciate you, brother. Thanks for showing me about white tea. He comes from Fujian, and we were drinking tea. He worked at a tea house in Chengdu, and we were drinking tea with him and my, my old roommate, Lance. And he busted out a bing of white tea. And up to that point, I'd only had loose white peony and loose silver needle and always fresh. Hold on. Mmm, yeah. It's like fresh baked flowers. And, and so the, you know, I'm gonna do a Jin Run Pao on this one. I'm just gonna give it a little bit of hot water, let it kind of blossom, and then I'll pour this much cooler water on it. Um, so he, he, he's like, you wanna drink some white tea? And I was like, sure, I'm in your tea house. We'll drink your white tea. And he busts out just a little piece of a cake, just like this big. And that was my introduction to aged white tea. We'll talk about that more later. The point is that I was like, this is amazing. Where did this come from? And he gave me the name of his friend, Li Yen Mei, and I went to Fujian later on that trip and I looked her up and she introduced me to the wonderful, wonderful world of white tea. First aged white tea, but she also served, served me the first silver needle that I ever enjoyed. She is a tea collector, she's a tea merchant, and she collects aged white tea beings, mostly from people that she grew up with. She's from Fuding, but her family also grows white tea and she produces this silver needle and it's Honestly, still the only silver needle that I really like. I'm gonna say that. And I haven't had every silver needle out there, so that's not to say there aren't other good ones, but I have never had a silver needle that I liked as much as this, and I never really thought I was gonna sell silver needle, but we get this one because it's so, you know. Anyway, Lee and May, amazing human being, amazing tea master, and she introduced me to white tea, and so I got into aged white tea first, and then by being introduced to really high quality fresh white tea, it finally, broke through and got me to like fresh white tea. Um, and yeah, this should be good. Go ahead and get this one going. Why am I cooling the water so much? Because if you wanna get the kind of like really fine fragrance of the white tea, you have to use cool water at least at the beginning. And I'll crank it up a little bit at the end. This is some really high grade fresh silver needle. This is the highest altitude that she produces and and it's got these really delicate floral fragrances, um, but they only come out with a little bit cooler water. And then after a couple steepings of this, I'm gonna crank up the water level just a little bit. And so when you steep this tea, you can see that the color is almost clear. You only get a tiny little bit of color there. can see these tiny downy hairs just floating in the water, just kind of rocking back and forth as my unsteady hand shakes holding this out. And that's the Bai Hao Yin Jun, the white hair silver needles that this tea refers to. And I'm just gonna drink this first one. That's why I did a Jin Run Pao on this one because I wanted to drink it uh, and I didn't want to throw away the first steeping because it's just so tender and juicy and nice, this tea and it's really expensive, so. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like, it's like drinking like the vapor trail of like a space unicorn, you know? Like a unicorn was just like tearing across space and just leaving like a, like a contrail of magic. That's what this tea tastes like to me. I just made that up on camera just now. I hadn't thought of that before, but I was just, you know, feeling it. So I'm gonna do a little bit more of this. Mm. I've got a method this time. I'm not gonna throw away all my nice tea. I got these big wood-fired dye cups. I'm just gonna pour the extra in here. This way, y'all get to see a couple different steepings of this tea and see how it progresses, and my lovely production crew gets to drink all this nice tea that I'm making here without wasting it. I'm gonna crank it up now, crank up the heat.
I'm just gonna go straight from my kettle. Ooh, yeah, oh yeah. It's like, it looks like someone just like, it's like frozen buds, like the buds just like, it's a frosty morning and these buds just have a little bit of frost on them. And so kind of the, the, the natural way to do a three tea episode of fresh white tea would be to do Silver Needle and then By Madon and then Show May, the three grades that I just talked about. But as I mentioned before, I really prefer By Madon and Show May aged. And so I don't actually get fresh Show May or fresh By Madon um, because I just like it so much better aged. But Silver Needle, I have not actually uh, experimented much with aged Silver Needle, although I did just get a 2018 Silver Needle being. I'm excited to try it. I have tried aged silver needles before, but I haven't had one that jumped out at me and I was like, this is amazing. And so my theory is that some of these all bud teas don't tend to age that well. And I'm not sure if that's just because the nature of the buds uh, that they don't like to oxidize because they're so tight and they've got all the little hairs and everything uh, and they're all wrapped up or uh, got a little more color this time, almost like a silvery green. Um, or why exactly that's the case, but I am going to try this 2018 Silver Needle Bing soon, see if it's gained anything from its age. It definitely didn't get worse. Um, the white tea, aged white teas I've had that are a few years old don't get worse. They just don't seem to uh, gain much from their aging process. Mm. Mm. Apple, like green apple, getting a little bit of green apple notes. And just like this very bright freshness it's really hard to explain. It's kind of like, like you took a whole bunch of flowers and you rolled over them with like a steamroller and then you just like went ice skating on top of it. Yeah, that's, that's what I got. Got a lot of weird, weird tasting notes today, but I'm just in one of those moods, you know? The tea just makes you feel the way it makes you feel. So I'm gonna go ahead and Give this one to the boys. And I'm gonna put this guy here. And that way y'all can look at these nice little leaves. Leave the lid off. Boom. Yeah. So now we're gonna move on to the next tea. But like I said, I'm not gonna to go to Bai Mudan because I don't get fresh Bai Mudan. Uh, but I do, there are a lot of other fresh white teas that I do like. As I mentioned, white tea originates in Fujian but they make it now in lots of different parts of China, including places that it wasn't necessarily traditional um, to do. I'm gonna drink this first. Yep, yep. Steamrolled flowers. Um, so this next tea comes to us from a region that doesn't traditionally produce white tea, which is my adopted home province in China is Sichuan which is the, where Chengdu is. That's where I lived for three years. And I spent, I spent more time in Sichuan province probably than any other province, although I do spend a lot of time in Yunnan too. But I did live there for three years, so it probably wins. Um, Sichuan province traditionally produces green tea and yellow tea, Huangya, and He Cha, but they don't really tr produce white tea. So what is this? What is this Sichuanese white tea that I've got? This is called uh, Shi Xiang Song Jian Cha, 10 flavor tendon relaxing tea, which is, I, 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 you know, it's so funny. That sounds like a weird name. Um, and Chinese, it's just a different culture, you know? Tendon relaxing is not as popular of a pastime here as it is in China. And so we named this one Inner Sun to avoid confusing people. But a couple months ago, I was serving this to a Chinese friend who was from China. And I told her the name in Chinese, and she's like, oh, that's a really good name. And I was like, you know what I'm talking about? Like tendons and rocks? And she's like, yeah. I was like, and that's a good name? And she's like, yeah, that's a great name. I'm like, okay. And the genius behind this tea who gave it this apparently awesome name is named Hung Yi. And he is a, a tea master, a consummate tea master from Sichuan province, another good friend of mine. Um, and also someone who's introduced to me by Lance. So Lance has been my, my old roommate, Lance, if you're watching this, appreciate you, bro. He introduced me to Yu Shi Hong and he also introduced me to Hung Yi. And so Hung Yi, Lance has got a lot, of, a lot to do with this episode. 
But Hung Yi is from a tea family. He's from two tea families. His paternal grandfather discovered wild tea plants in their village of Ma Bien in the mountains, where people grow tea, but he went into the woods and he found all these wild tea plants, or maybe feral tea plants, but they really look wild. I finally got to go there this last year, and all this time I've been calling Hung Yi's tea plants feral because of this narrative that the only wild tea plants are in Yunnan. But when I saw these plants, I was like, mm, these look pretty wild. They're like just out there in the forest. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna do one more thing. I'm gonna do one last steep into this one. I'm gonna put it on the thing so you can see it like in the old days. We did this with uh, the Wu Yi episode, or no, we did this with uh, one of those other episodes. We had all the Gongda Bays out there. It looked really nice, I'm gonna do that again. And this way you'll get to see the progression of the color of the liquor, how it goes from being almost as clear as water to being, well, you'll see. I don't wanna spoil it for y'all. But <laughs> you can probably uh, infer what I'm, what I'm getting at there. Um, but Hung Yi, was, his grandfather discovered these wild plants and started working with them, by which I mean he started making tea from them. And this is a long time ago, this is many decades ago. And then the, the next generation, Hung Yi's father, was in the military and did not work with tea at all. He had nothing to do with tea. And then after he retired from the military, he uh, opened a furniture store selling traditional Chinese furniture. And then his son, Hung Yi, took back up the mantle of being a tea master and working with these tea plants. But since his dad couldn't teach him about it, his mom taught him about it, because Hung Yi's mother does also come from a tea producing family, and she's really awesome. I got to meet her this last time, and she is an amazing tea master. She makes one of my favorite green teas ever, which is Esmeralda, and I'll talk about that some other time. But she's really cool. She taught him how to make green tea. The style of green tea that's produced in Ma Bien is a very, uh, informal, what I call a uh, Western Chinese vernacular green style, which is kind of like, kind of like a Su Mao Feng or, or um, even like, uh, um, like Guan Guan Cha or some of these very informal green teas. They don't have a special shape to them. They're not little flat sparrows tongues. They're not special little curls. They're not rolled up into little balls. They're just kind of, you know, leaves go blah, blah, blah. And I love those teas. I love these colloquial Western Chinese greens. And Hung Yi learned first how to make this, making a tea called Ma Bian Mao Jian, but he was not satisfied with just making the same type of tea over and over again. He wanted to do something different. And so he started learning how to make other kinds of tea from tea masters around China. He studied with a female tea master from Fujian, from the Wuyi Mountains, and learned how to make red tea in the style of Jinjuan Mei. And although he doesn't really make Jinjuan Mei style red tea anymore, he did learn, he did master the technique originally of, of oxidizing tea um, in studying that. And so he makes like Crimson Spring. And then he learned how to make um, yellow tea. He went to Mengding Mountain, which is not far at all from um, from, uh, from where he lives in Ma Bien, is also in Sichuan, and learned how to make the Sichuanese style yellow called Huang Ya, yellow buds or yellow sprout. And then he learned how to make white tea. Actually, he just kind of learned on his own how to make white tea by experimenting, by reading, and by talking to people. But he didn't go undertake a formal study of making uh, white tea the way he did with the others because it is so naturalistic and because really the skill of making any given white tea is very much going to be up to the master getting to know their individual plants in their individual climate. The skills that you might have in Fujian making Fuding white tea in the mountains of Fuding would not necessarily translate to the mountains of Ma Bien and Sichuan where the tea and the climate are totally different. So I'm gonna go ahead and give y'all Another little look at this really beautiful white tea that we call Inner Sun, AKA 10 flavor, 10 and relaxing tea. <laughs> Which, yeah, it's a great name in Chinese. Doesn't work as well in English. This is actually a, a new tea that he started making in the past couple of years. Before this, we got a tea that we just called Ma Bien White from him. And that was his initial foray into making white teas. And he's refined his technique. He's a, he's a scientist. He's very much a tea scientist. He has actually informally identified 
uh, he believes about 20 different varieties uh, or sub-breeds of these wild tea plants. These aren't breeds like Da Bai and Da Hao, the, the white tea breeds of the East are. These are more like lineages of plants. They're related to each other, but they're all seed propagated. And so they're not going to be a breed in the formal sense, but they, he's identified these different morphs of these wild Mabian tea plants, and he started working with certain ones specifically. And so one of these breeds he finds makes really good white tea. And you can see there's buds in here, but they're itty bitty. They're not these big plump, see there's one, there's a little bud there. They're not these big juicy, full, buddy looking buds like you see. They're just kind of like scraggly, informal, itty bitty, tiny little buds and most of its leaves because this is not, unlike silver needle, this tea has not been sorted. It is an early spring pick, which is why the leaves are nice and little and you do get a lot of fuzziness to it, but they're not these, um, these very manicured little buds. And because this is wild tea, because this is seed propagated tea, you get a very dynamic and complex character to this. This is actually my fiance, Lindsay's favorite tea in the world, and it's actually a lot of people's favorite white tea. Wow, look at that, five, that's five grams of tea. Just filled my gawan right up, mm-hmm. Hope you boys are ready to party. Drop the leaf, Bloop. So, man, that looks really pretty in this dye gawan. It's a nice match for that. So, Hung Yi is kind of a little tea rebel. He's out there in Western China making Eastern Chinese teas, like white tea, and this one, has been selected for this particular uh, breed. So he's, he's developed a specific way of making white tea with a specific breed of white tea plants. And not really a breed, but like a sub race of white tea plants that grow wild in Ma Bien. And he just very simply dries them in that white tea way and you get this really immense, buttery, um, very nourishing feeling tea. and. This particular, the silver needle that we just drank does have really nice chi, um, but there's something about the wild plants that brings a little something extra to the table with respect to chi, and there's also something about the seed propagated plants bringing something extra chi-wise to the table. And this, is, this one is really a masterpiece. That little bing in front of the plant is a bing of the highest grade of this type of tea. This is the uh, little, 200 gram bing of, of inner sun and this is and that's like the earliest spring pick of it and so I'm going to give this a smell see if I can do some more freaky tasty notes for you mmm you get some of that like squashy pumpkin ooh mmm yeah, yeah ooh it's on the tip of my tongue like squashy pumpkiny kind of stuff but then there's a burst of some kind of almost like a like a citrus almost like a like some kind of like a, like a grapefruit, if a grapefruit was a berry, you know what I mean? Like, hmm. And you still get some of this like hazelnutty, kind of smooth, buttery, hazelnutty note. And as you can see, you're starting off with a little more color. This, this, this steeping's about a little, little bit lighter than the third steeping of Silver Needle, but it's gonna get darker as we go, and I'm really, you know, just use another one of these cups, why not? I've got three cups sitting here. I don't have to wash my cup, I just got a new cup. Let's see. And I'm really excited for this, because we were out of this tea for a hot minute, and my fiance drinks this like it is going out of style. Mmm. I'm getting like, like, like a berry and cream sort of profile from this, like a blueberries and whipped cream sort of like note, like, like I ate something with blueberries and whipped cream like a couple minutes ago. Let me get this first steeping out of here and then I'll do another one, we'll see how that color progresses. And I'm gonna hold this guy up. You look at these leaves and you see that they're all different colors. You don't get as much uniformity from this. That's because they're wild seed propagated plants. And even though they're 
morphologically similar to each other, uh, phenotypically similar, which is why he's grouped them as being a single type of these wild tea plants, there's still a lot of diversity among the leaves as opposed to silver needle, which is very uniform because those are cloned plants. So I, I'm gonna emphasize this again. This is a Western white tea from a region that does not traditionally produce white tea from Sichuan province. And it is distinct from the Eastern Fuding white teas by being grown from seed propagated, especially wild plants. Okay, let's do another one of these guys. Mm-hmm, it's real pretty, it's real pretty. You almost get, you get a lot of purple leaves in this one. And he actually does make, he, there are purple tea plants in, in Mabian, and he does make some teas that are just with those. And that's the, the Emily Bing and the Unto Truth Bing. Those are both made with these purple white teas. But this one is not selected specifically for being purple, but you do get a couple purple ones in there. So I'm going hotter this time. Going to get a little more juice out of it. There we go. Getting that bright green gold color out of there. And you still get some downy hairs in here, but they're not as big, they're not as distinct, and there's not, they're not as prolific because this plant has not been bred for that trait in the same way. I'm gonna drink this one. This is the second steep, and it's gonna be really nice. Oh, no, wrong cup. This is the right cup. I don't want to use that cup anymore. That's my silver needle cup. This is my inner sun cup. Get more of that juiciness. It's getting really juicy. Like, it tastes refreshing. If I was thirsty, I'm a little thirsty, but it's like thirst quenching, almost. And definitely a lot more robust <clears throat> than Silver Needle because of the inclusion of those leaves. And just in a very general sense, the paradigm is buds for fragrance, leaves for flavor. And just like I mentioned, the, the, if, if the buds are the icing on the cupcake and the leaves are the cake part of the cupcake, I mean, you don't always want just icing. Sometimes you want some cupcake in there. You want some of that cakey part in there. And that's when, you know, when you get these leafier white teas, you get a little bit more robustness in the mouth, a little bit more substance to them. A little less ethereal, a little more earthly. And then I'm getting this orchid perfume. Along that, that hazelnut taste is kind of morphing into this sort of what the Chinese refer to as the, the uh, lan hua xiang, the orchid fragrance. You know, orchids don't necessarily have a fragrance, but some do. I used to think that no orchids had a fragrance, but actually some of them do have a fragrance. But there is this very distinctive floral note that you get in lots of different teas, and the Chinese refer to it as the orchid fragrance. And it becomes present in this tea on the first steeping, extremely dynamic tea. It evolves very much from one steeping to the next. Mm. Oh yeah, okay, I'm gonna... Got a nice big cup of, so of inner sun for somebody here. Who's gonna get the lucky cup? I'm just gonna mix them up and y'all can just pick one afterwards and, and you'll just get what you get. I'm gonna switch to this kettle because it's a little hotter and get my silver needle cup out of here. You're done, son. Then one more steeping of this for the camera. Yeah, give it a little more time. I'll just get a little extra color on here so you can see what it would be like in three or four steepings. This one, I'll get like a good like 10, 15 steepings out of inner sun. It's crazy. That's the thing about white teas is that White teas, I used to think that white teas didn't have much longevity to them. Uh, they weren't very nai pao. You couldn't steep them many times. Again, that was because I was drinking some low quality and fresh teas. But uh, although this tea is fresh, I can still get lots of steepings out of it. That silver needle, get lots of steepings out of it. Aged white teas go forever. You just gotta quit at a certain point. You just gonna be like, well, I guess I'm done drinking tea. You win, tea. I'm going home. Get a little, I wanna get a little shot of this sitting in the water too. It's really pretty. I have a very special, I mean, not just because my fiance loves it, I also have a very special relationship with this white tea. Watching Hung Yi's skill improve over time, he's upgraded all of his tea processes. And, and his teas, uh, I've always loved his teas, but his, these new teas that I just tried this past year, including Inner Sun, are now some of my favorite teas of their, of their ca respective categories. Um, Welcoming Springs, one of my favorite green teas, like all time favorite green teas now, that's one of his also, also made from wild plants. There we go. Get that nice golden color. And 
and then I'll set you right here in her sun. Um, and you know, my tendons do feel more relaxed now. I'm actually gonna steal one of these because I'm just not, I'm not done with this tea yet. Wow, beautiful. Look how pretty that is. Look, look at that. I wish I had three of the same gong dao bang. Next time, next time I will. But you can definitely see the distinction in the color there where you have this very pale, silvery green liquor and then you have a much more robust, brighter golden liquor, but still not red. It doesn't have much redness to it. So we'll put these side by side here. You can kind of check them out and see what they look like there. Mm. Mm. I want to say it's got like a winey taste, like wine. I don't know if that makes sense, but I don't know. It's it's trick. Just try some. You all get some and try some, and you can give me some better tasting notes. Cause <laughs> I'm I'm just like talking about flowers and a steamroller and all this kind of weird stuff. So. We have journeyed now from the home of white teas in the east to the home of teas in the west. Tea, the plant, originates in western China, in Yunnan, Guangxi, Guizhou, places like that. Sichuan even has wild trees, as we are seeing right now. But as tea makes its way east, it doesn't make its way east as a natural organism spreading and expanding its domain. It makes its way across China with human beings. Tea farmers are taking the seeds of the tea plant, bringing them with them and transmitting them, trading them, and, and the tea as a crop makes its way to the east. And so in the west, tea is from there. That's its hometown. It lives there naturally. And so the plants that you get there are gonna be more um, ancestral. They're gonna be closer to the ancestral ancient tea plants. But as you get to the, um, the east of China, you have these plants that are highly cultivated. They've been bred because they've been carried east by people, transmitted east by uh, tea farmers, and they're breeding them as they go. They're taking them and they're, each generation, they're choosing which plants to mate together to get more seeds, and they're selecting for certain traits. And those traits might be necessary for them to survive to the new climate, to adapt and survive to the new climate, or they could be for some desirable quality with respect to the tea, the finished product of the tea itself. And this is, this, this is a really nice gaiwan. This is a wood-fired gaiwan. I love wood-fired anything, and like wood-fired dye wares are absolutely my, they're just like, mm, mm. Get this guy warm. This one holds heat super well. And there we go. And then look at this crazy tea. Look at this guy. Compared to that dainty little silver needle, this one's just busting out, can't close the lid. This tea doesn't care. It's like five grams, I'll take up as much space as I want. You can't put me in a box. What is this? This is from Yunnan. We have continued to travel west. We have gone from eastern China, very civilized eastern China, been settled for a long time on the coast, lots of trade close to the capital. We've gone west to Sichuan province, still a very ancient part of China. It's been part of China right since China was China. And now we're in Yunnan, the wild west of the east. One of my favorite provinces in China. This is where Puar comes from. And in fact, this is Puar. This is from the Puar plants. This is wild purple white is what we call it. It's Ziya Bai Cha. So purple bud, white tea. And it's from Nanwa Mountain. And this is made by Mr. Li Shu Lin, whose name you may recognize. He makes all of our puars and a lot of our red teas and a lot of our white teas and he is my homie and he actually this is a really cool story so what is wild purple first of all if you have not seen the shung puar episode go check it out it's a gem and we uh, talk a little bit about the different types of puar in there purpleness is a naturally occurring trait in tea plants although it is rare it's like red hair in humans it is kind of a mutation and it's a very attractive mutation, and it also is responsible for certain plant pigments, anthocyanin and proanthocyanidins, that are good for you. They're good for your capillary strength, they're good for your metabolism, they keep your cholesterol down. So they have become highly sought after in recent years, so much so that they have developed a breed of purple tea called Zhenjian Cha, 
which is Purple Grace or Purple Beauty. You've probably seen that or, or tried that. We have a lot of teas made from this breed, including Ultraviolet, including Purple Grace, including moon, Purple Moonlight. But this is from the naturally occurring wild purple plants. The plants themselves aren't wild the way that the inner sun is wild. They're still cultivated, big leaf variety poor tea plants, but they are seed propagated. And they're purple just because of that's how they are. It's just their natural state. No one decided to make them purple. They have not been bred for their purpleness, and yet they are purple nonetheless. And so when you pick the purple plants and, and, and process them separately, you get Ziya Cha, which we call wild purple. And this one is actually kind of, uh, kind of like our invention a little bit, um, because it was, I think it was three, two or three years ago, we were on Nanua Mountain. Uh, I was there with Moncho, AKA Slowhand T, uh, Moncho of Slowhand T. And he was like, we should get him to make a, a purple white tea. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, yeah, make white tea out of purple leaves. There is a tradition of white tea in Yunnan and it's called Yue Guangbai, Moonlight White. And you may have heard of this type of tea. We carry a very nice Moonlight White also from Li Shu Lin. And this is basically when you take a Yunnan tea breed like the Daiye Zhong or Taoyensis or one of these other ancestral tea breeds and you make white tea out of it. Man, I'm gonna be able to close the lid on this guy, Wan. Get in there, tea. We're trying to film a show here. You need to cooperate. This one I'm gonna rinse. It's unruly. This tea needs a bath. <laughs> there you go, Chanchu. You get some tea today. But um, so yeah, and then we were like, hey Lee, can you make some white tea out of purple tea? And he goes, which purple tea? You want Zijian Cha or Ziya Cha? I'm like, both. So then uh, last year when we came back, he was like, hey, remember that purple white tea you wanted? Well, I did it. And uh, so there's two of them. There's Purple Moonlight is what we call the Zijuan, the purple breed, the variety that's been bred for the sake of being purple. We call Purple Moonlight. And then Wild Purple White, we just call it, well, we call the Ziya Cha when it's Sheng Puo, we call it Wild Purple. So this is Wild Purple White. And it's amazing. I almost did the Purple Moonlight because the leaves look more purple, but this is just a better tea. I mean, Purple Moonlight's amazing. It's a beautiful and amazing tea. But this one, I really wanted to drink this one, so, so. So there you go, you know? When you, you get your own show, you can drink whatever tea you want. So you can see a little bit of the purpleness there, and again, very heterogeneous leaf, leaf color there. You've got some leaves that are kind of brown, some leaves are kind of green, and then some leaves have that kind of bluish cast to them. That is the purpleness. And you know, all of these are from purple leaf-bearing plants, but they're gonna be different just like you've got different kinds of redheads. Some redheads have reddish brown hair and some have strawberry blonde hair and some have that red Ronald McDonald hair. Um, purple tea plants are the same way. You get all kinds of different colors among these so-called purple tea plants. And because they're seed propagated, they're all genetically distinct from each other. Beautiful tea, beautiful fragrance. You get some like syrupy sweetness on the, the smell here and almost like, um, like bubblegum flavored things not bubblegum itself, but like, you know when you get a blue snow cone and you're like, what flavor is this supposed to be? And they're like, bubblegum. And you're like, okay, it doesn't taste like bubblegum, but I get that this is what it gets called bubblegum taste. You get a little bit of that in this tea. And also a little bit of savoriness. You almost get a little bit of like, a, like an umami kind of savoriness to this tea. And, and again, there's some berry notes. Uh, there's some like distant berry notes sort of indistinct, not so much like blueberries and cream like that last one, but more of an indistinct mixed berry kind of character. So let's see, the first steeping this one, let's see what it looks like. Nice and clear, very clear. Get my wild purple white cup. Get some of that berry stuff. You get a lot of like, you get a lot more minerality on this tea. That's something that you don't get with those fooding whites. They're very refined, they're very soft. You don't get a lot of that earth taste, that minerality. 
And that's something that you do get specifically from Nanua mountain teas. That's a very common attribute of the Nanua teas is that strong minerality. And boom, I'll go ahead and do a second steeping this one. And I think I need to reheat my water. All right, we're back with hotter water. I was like, can I make it through the end of the episode without reheating the water? And I was like, this tea deserves hot water. This tea deserves better. So got my hot water. Well, I'm gonna use hot water, hotter water for this also because you get to these coarser grades of tea um, from these very dainty little white buds through to like a slightly later in the spring, less, less segregated pick, less sorted pick to this um, kind of like wild and crazy anything goes white tea here. And another reason, I forgot to mention this earlier, but another reason I chose these three teas is because while I'm not doing Silver Needle, White Peony, Chaumet, the classic kind of uh, three grades of white tea, these teas in their plucking standard and the earliness of their pluck do mimic those. The Silver Needle is real Silver Needle. And then Inner Sun is kind of like by Mudan. It's kind of, it's a, a leafier white tea, but it's still got some buds. And then this this um, wild purple white with its big giant leaves is very much like a Chaumet. And I'm actually interested to see how this ages because he just started making it because we asked him to. And yeah, so I'm very interested to see this. And what you can see is that, there we go. Now we got some color. Now you're cooking with gas. Boom. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Blue Bear Bubblegum, or what is it? Yeah, what I say, Bubblegum Snow Cone. So, and so as you get into these coarser grades of tea, and by that I mean more leaves, less buds, you can use hotter water, you get more color, you get more flavor in the mouth. You get less of that, like, those like crisp apple notes that I got on the that silver needle. It's not what this is about. This is not unicorn contrails. This is much more down to earth. This is like, you know, uh, uh, bubblegum, snow cone in like a tree stump. You know, you got a hole, let's say you had a tree stump that was like kind of hollow and you just turned it into a big snow cone and you made it bubblegum flavor. Mmm, yeah. And it gets really good huegan, the returning sweetness. That's something that you get much more out of these leafier grades of white tea is that mouth feel where it kind of just grabs your mouth. You can feel it, coat your tongue, coat the inside of your mouth. Mm, man, that's really nice. I'm gonna be jazzed tonight. So and another, another, another thing about it, you know, tea and caffeine, white tea and caffeine. People say white tea has the least caffeine. Nah, it's not always true. Because it, what it is, I think that the caffeine is less soluble and less bioavailable in white tea because it hasn't been oxidized uh, to the same degree. It hasn't been cooked. And the, uh, the downy hairs of the tea and the fact that it's raw make the stuff, the tea juice in it, a little bit less soluble. But actually, when you're talking about buds like Silver Needle, the buds of the tea, as I mentioned earlier, have the most caffeine of any part of the tea plant. They have all, all the tea chemicals are amplified in the buds. So when people say white tea has the least caffeine, functionally, it can be said that the infusion of white tea has the least caffeine, the least soluble, the least bioavailable caffeine. So when you drink it, you're getting less caffeine. <clears throat> But if you were to grind it all up and eat the leaves, you'd be getting more caffeine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. And this one actually does have a lot of floral notes. I was just saying how it's not as fragrant, but it's actually pretty, pretty juicy. Yeah, here we go. I'm actually gonna pour off this first one. The water was too cold. The water was too cold. Pour it off. I'm gonna start fresh, making a nice big cup of this wild purple white. And do another one of these bad boys. Yeah. Moonlight White is a really interesting tea because it combines this very Eastern Chinese tea processing style with a Western Chinese variety of plant, which is the Dai Yejong big leaf plants. And it's called Moonlight White. They say that because they, they dry it and then they let it sit there and they, they collect it the next day. So it spends some time under the light of the moon. Apparently not always, it really depends on the environment. But I guess one thing about white tea is that when you taste a green tea or a sheng puar, which is kind of like green tea, I say that that's a great way to taste the, the terroir or the diwei. D 
Diwei and Terhuar mean the same thing. They mean the flavor of the earth. And that's, what is that? That's the, the earth, the soil, the water that the tea grew up in. But when you drink white tea, you're, getting, you're not getting as faithful of a representation of just the pure Diwei, but you're getting the combination of the Diwei and the Tian Qi, the weather. Because white tea, unlike other teas, spends a lot of time outside under the open sky. And it is being processed not by people, but by the weather, by nature itself. And so drinking white tea, you get a little bit more of a taste of not just the soil, not just the water, but also the wind and the sun and the condensation and all of those attributes of the outside world, what they call the Da Ziran, the great nature in China. And, you know, although these are fresh white teas, as a caveat, you don't want to drink white teas too fresh. You want to give them at least two months to cure. And what they're doing is that when they're too fresh, they have what's called the Qing Cao Wei, or the Tai Yang Wei, which means green grass flavor or sunshine flavor. And that's this idea that sitting under the sun, they have absorbed the flavor of the sunlight, which is not really what's going on. It's really some kind of like chlorophyll thing or some kind of unoxidized tea chemicals that produce this kind of very cloyingly sweet, uh, grassy, like fresh cut grass taste, which is not considered desirable. And so the white tea needs about two months to breathe those out and to cure those away. And you don't get it as much in fresh green tea because the cooking process, the Sha Qing eliminates some of that Tai Yang Wei, that sunshine flavor. Actually, it's, it's what they call it the, the Qing Cao Wei in, in Western China with like Puar. They'll say it has Qing Cao Wei, but then in the East in, in Fujian, they say Tai Yang Wei, the sunshine flavor and you don't want too, too much of that. And that goes away after about two months of aging. I'm gonna go do one last long one for you. This tea cannot be made bitter. Actually, none of these three teas can be made bitter. Um, they just get nice and rich and eventually they'll just cut themselves off at a certain point. They're very polite. Gonna go ahead and get this guy out of there, and then we'll check out the color on this last one. See if we get a little bit more depth of color on this last steeping. So, the world of fresh white teas, this was probably the last category of tea, except for maybe Hei Cha's, Hunan Hei Cha's, that I really took a shine to, and I was like, okay, I get it now. I get why people like these. Um, but it really comes down to the, the, the cleanness of the environment, White tea, there's nowhere for the flavor to hide because there's not really any processing to speak of. And so white teas, all teas, it's very important that they're clean. All teas, you're gonna taste if there's chemicals in the tea, if there's bad production, if there's bad farming methods being used, it's going to affect the overall quality of the tea. But the more processing is done to the tea, the less apparent those shortcomings will be if the processing is good. But white tea, there's nowhere to hide. There's no processing being done. And so you need to have extremely clean, extremely high quality tea as your starting material. Even though less physical work goes into producing them, the standard by which you have to produce white tea is extremely high. And let's see. Let me see if I can, can do one of these, these like, uh, like St. Pauli girl sort of thing. Get a little bit more. So yeah, so you get a little bit more redness in that inner sun than this last one, but you get a very robust flavor from this wild purple white that is a little bit more robust than the inner sun because the inner sun is a little smaller leaf varietal, a little bit more refined. And, uh, and then both of those are gonna be a little bit darker and more flavorful than your silver needle. So there you have it, the wonderful world of fresh white tea. If you are like me or like I was and you think that you don't like white tea, I suggest that you try some different kinds of white tea. Try a couple of different kinds of white tea. Maybe get away from trying all bud white teas and try something a little bit leafier and see if that's more to your speed. Or try some aged white teas. We're gonna talk about that in the next episode. Thank you all for joining us today. It's great to be back making these for you and we hope to see you in the next episode. Thank you.